Hey, Kyle's wonderful here again with another wrestling review. This time it's Ring of Honor, ROH, Death Before Dishonor 2022, live from Lowell, Massachusetts, July 23rd, 2022. This is the return of ROH. We haven't seen ROH since Supercard of Honor. That was the only other show they've had in 2022. Um, that first show, this is the first complete event under the control of Tony Khan and AEW. Most of the people on the last ROH event, Supercard of Honor, were already booked for the show before Tony Khan took over. So Khan did make the decisions at the last show, but this is the first one completely under his direction. Um, and now we get to see what direction ROH goes from here Under now that it's underneath the AEW banner. So hopefully we can find out more info about a weekly ROH show tonight. But unfortunately, spoiler alert, we do not find out anything more about ROH going forward. We don't know when the next pay-per-view is going to be. We don't know when the next weekly show or is going to start or anything like that. So I guess we're just going to have to keep watching AEW and find out more information as it comes in. Um, so we've got four matches on the pre-show tonight that the ROH uh, Ring of Honor calls their pre-shows the Zero Hour. And we'll start there, and then I'll preview the matches as we get to them. So we'll just start right into the action here. The The main card pay-per-view lasted about three hours, and then we got an hour of pre-show here, the zero hour with four matches as well. So about four hours all together, pretty good length for a, a big event, and it was a pretty good show overall. Definitely a thumbs up from me. So let's get into it. I got a few things to nitpick, especially the terrible direct. Whoever the director was for this show was one of the worst. Uh, this is one of the worst directed uh, big live events I've ever seen in wrestling in a long, long time. So a, a little bit of a nitpick there, but the wrestling was awesome. So it definitely had like an NXT takeover feel to it where you know you're going to expect some great wrestling, not a lot of story into it. We, we set up a lot of things over on Rampage, the great countdown show. If you missed my preview for D Death Before Dishonor, it was on the same video as last week's Rampage review. I ended that review with a preview for the show if you want to know um, some of the build into it. So Ian Riccoboni and Caprice Coleman welcome us to the Zero Hour. And they mentioned that even more announcers were a match uh, announced for tonight. But um, maybe I misheard them because no extra matches that weren't announced beforehand. There was no extra matches. So anyway, um, Bobby Cruz is the ROH ring announcer, and he'll be the ring announcer tonight. And the first wrestler we see on this show is Colt Boom Boom Cabana. So reports were coming out in the last few months that Colt Cabana wanted out of AEW. But it looks like Colt was talked into staying but only to go to ROH instead. So by telling Colt Cabana, hey, why don't you not leave and go on the ROH roster instead? Seems like they got Colt Cabana to stay. And that tells me that it was maybe awkward for Colt to be around his former best friend, CM Punk, all the time, especially with CM Punk becoming champion and stuff like that. So uh, Colt's name graphic says that um, when he comes out, this is his 20 271st match in ROH. And Colt Cabana's opponent, on the other, other hand, is making his ROH debut, Anthony Green, who's accompanied by his workhorseman tag team partner, J.D. Drake. And they have the workhorseman music and entrance video. So maybe workhorseman will be in the ROH uh, in the future. We're not quite sure what the roster is going to be. We don't even know what kind of television or events they're going to have going forward, like I said. But um, he, we did get to see Anthony Green Tuesday on AEW Dark have a really good match against Konosuke Takeshita, which everybody has a good match against Takeshita. But this one should be good. Let's see. Um, how the veteran Colt Cabana does against the debuting Anthony Henry here. Henry takes Colt down right at the start, and the crowd starts a huge Colt, Colt Cabana chant. They really love to see him there. The crowd seems really loud and ready for this show as the men tie up now, and it goes to the ropes. Henry tries the big-time Colt on the clean break by shoving him around, but Colt takes exception and shoves Henry right back. Henry tries to fight back and does uh, and, and is successful with an ankle pick to take down Colt Cabana. The reverse grapples on the mat for a little while and it gets to the ropes again. No clean break again. Uh, uh, Henry takes a cheap shot. So Colt uh, is able to surprise Henry with a Matt Classic style pin for a two count. And that was the display of the experience Colt brings into this match right here. JD Drake senses some danger, so distracts from the ringside. Anthony Henry is able to take control off this and cranks the neck of Colt Cabana with his legs. The crowd did not approve of this uh, these actions from 
against Colt Cabana. So Colt has previous neck injuries. Henry cranks the neck a second time. Now mounts for some punches. Anthony Henry's complete control now. The crowd chants for Colt Cabana, who tries to fight back, but a thrust kick from Henry keeps control. Henry puts on a bow and arrow type maneuver and then is working over the shoulders of Colt. Colt is in pain, but firing up after a bunch of strikes. Colt then ducks under a roundhouse kick, but Henry hits a big pile driver. Colt Cabana is just barely able to get a foot on the rope to stop the pin. Henry then focuses on the neck even more, hitting knees to the face with a cravat as well. Colt then catches a, a kick, and it hits a whirly bird slam. That was looked really good. Colt now on the attack with jabs, a bionic elbow, and some loud chops. Colt runs into the corner, hitting a massive forearm, then the flying apple, and a huge lariat. Big flurry from Colt Cabana that gets him a two count on Anthony Henry. Um, the action spills outside now, and Colt punches Henry, then turns to punch J.D. Drake, who is lurking nearby. Colt tries to get back in the ring, but, uh, but behind the referee's back, J.D. Drake slams Colt down. Henry then gets Colt, uh, sends Colt into the barricade and throws Colt in the ring. Henry goes to the top rope and hits a big frog splash. Colt Cabana is able to kick out at two on this one. Henry tries to stay on the attack, but Colt's able to dodge a top rope attack. Henry then reverses a Billy Goat's curse, but block, uh, Colt blocks a German suplex right after that. Anthony Henry jumps up and applies a guillotine, but Colt reverses that into the Billy's goes, Billy Goat's curse. And J.D. Drake's now on the apron, and Colt breaks the hold. Colt knocks J.D. to the apron, and it hits a beautiful-looking moonsault for the one, two, three. Your winner of the match by pinfall, Colt Boom Boom Cabana. Colt improves his bad record at Death Before Dishonor to three wins and eight losses. Colt is now two and zero since ROH has been taken over by Tony Khan, also winning on the pre-show of Death Bef or uh, Supercard of Honor. So pretty good match to kick us off. The crowd loves seeing Colt Cabana back, and I, I do agree. I'm glad Colt Cabana didn't uh, get his release like he asked. Instead, they want him to go to ROH, and he agreed. So um, next match is an interesting one. First out is Shinobi's Shadow Squad. This is Eli Isom and Cheeseburger. I've seen these guys many times before, and they're awesome. Uh, Cheeseburger actually trained Eli Isom, who's only been a pro for about three years now, Isom has. So I'm even more intrigued by their opponent's Truth Busters. So on Rampage this week, we saw a vignette for a debuting, uh, formerly known as Arya Davari, now known as Ari Davari. So just a little shortened on the first name. And um, basically, it looked like Arya Davari was like a rich guy. He was hanging out in a, um, a bit, like a warehouse, cool looking, like I'm not in a bad looking warehouse, but maybe it was an office building. And anyway, now it looks like Truth Busters might be part of a larger stable. It's tonight. It's going to be Ari Davari and his partner Slim J. And those two really don't seem like they would be the type to hang out. So. Um, maybe that tells us that there is more truth busters than just these two. Slim J is a slim shady ripoff who's been around the business for 20 years. One of the innovators of the style that we see all the time uh, nowadays. So I have seen Slim J before back in TNA 20 years ago. And uh, we also saw Slim J in ROH uh, first debuting 20 years ago, November 2002. So Ari, Ari Divari has been a, a, was a mainstay on 205 Live in the WWE Cruiserweight division. Um, and you might know his uh, older brother, Sean Davari, who's most commonly just known as Davari. So Slim J, uh, I noticed, has Yukiro, uh, Yujiro Takahashi's face, which is pretty weird. He, they look like the exact same guy almost. Truth Busters have pretty weird music. It's like rock music that doesn't fit either of them. One of them's a Slim Shady Eminem guy, and the other one's a um, rich businessman. So the, the weird rock music here for the Truth Busters. Um, I still have those same pants that Slim J is wearing. Uh, Slim J is 37. I'm 36. I was also a huge Eminem fan. I'm from Detroit, just like Eminem, and I was 13 when his first album dropped. So you can already tell what kind of um, teenage years I had. So I refuse to ever wear tight jeans here in 2022. So I'm with I'm with you, Slim J. I still wear those baggy pants. Uh, huge cheeseburger chant from the crowd to start. Cheeseburger is a cult favorite of ROH and has been for a long time now. Ari starts strong, and he's going to start the match with against Cheeseburger. Um, Ari starts strong, and then Slim J tags in. Caprice tells us tells us that Slim J might look young, but he has been around a long time. Bro, Slim J looks about 40 years old. What are you even talking about? Yes, he's dressed like he's 17, but he has the face of a 40-year-old. 
<laughs> Weird statement by Caprice. But uh, Slim J maintains control and tags in Davari, who hits a big chop to Cheeseburger. A couple big chops. Cheeseburger counters twice in a row and then tag is able to tag in Eli Eason. Eli shows some great agility here at the start and quickens the pace. Beautiful arm drag by Eli. Then Davari, I think it was a Mexican style arm drag. Davari then hits a throat thrust and tags out the Slim J. Cheeseburger makes a blind tag and is able to hit a bulldog on Slim. G Cheeseburger then uses a Mexican arm bar himself while um, standing on the back of Slim J. Slim then hits a nice wheelbarrow flatliner, which I don't think I've ever seen before, and tags in Ari Davari off of that. Eli gets the crowd to rally behind Cheeseburger, who dodges the next attack. Now Eli tags in and takes both men down. And I've known of Eli for a while. He's definitely a quick learner for only being a four-year pro, and he's continuing to improve each each match. So Eli then hits a nice-looking combo that ended with a blue thunder bomb. Slim J has to come in and break the pin. Cheeseburger comes in, attacks Slim, but Slim counters into a double underhook tornado butterfly suplex. Another great move. Slim J looking great in this match. Slim J then hits a floating twisting cutter and a crossbody off the top. Davari hits a frog splash right after that for the one, two, three. And I had completely lost track of who the legal men were, but overall, really good match. Slim J showing he's probably a shame. He never got a bigger spotlight and a bigger promotion throughout his career, but only at 37, it's not like he can't be signed and have a nice five, six year run ahead of him. Coleman was putting over all that, all those moves we see from Slim J, um, or like a lot of moves we see in wrestling today were stolen and innovated from Slim J, who never got his uh, chance in the spotlight. So hopefully we get to see more of him in the future. I'm definitely intrigued with this Truth, Bu Truth Busters stable. I'm pretty sure it'll be a stable and not just a tag team of Ari Davari and Slim J. Ari Davari seems like the kind of guy he would be wanting to assemble um, a stable with his uh, writ. He'd be, you know, kind of like the Andrade family office where you buy out other people's contracts and stuff like that, which would explain how even though Ari Davari and Slim J seemingly have nothing in common, it would have just been Ari Davari using his wealth to uh, buy the contract or whatever. So I'm, I'm excited to see where that one goes. In the back now, we see Lexi Nair, who we normally see for AEW Dark and as the backstage interviewer, sometimes on Rampage and Dynamite uh, when Tony Schiavone doesn't do it. But she's here. It looks like she'll be, at least for now, the ROH backstage interviewer. And Lexi Nair is with Prince Nana of all people people another roh legend mostly as a manager so prince nana says he has breaking news and no freaking way prince nana says i have used my family's wealth to purchase tolly blanchard enterprises what the heck that's out of nowhere but that's awesome um tolly blanchard in roh really didn't seem like a good fit bringing back the legend prince nana to take his uh, place is a great move prince nana continues by saying if you don't know who i am you soon will and I'll be accompanying Brian Cage and Gates of Agony in their trios match. And I'll be accompanying Jonathan Grisham in his ROH world title match later on. So I did not see this coming, but I'm very intrigued. Definitely think that's a good idea to get Tully Blanchard out of there and put him, uh, replace him with Prince Nana. Same way that he bought out the contracts, you know, that I was just talking about with Ari Davari, who's also a wealthy guy trying to assemble a stable. So it looks like we've got competing wealthy stables in our witch. Potentially, maybe Ari Devari is only going to be AEW. We're not even quite sure what the heck's going on with the rosters and uh, the television show for our witch. So let's just enjoy what um, tonight's event for what it is for the most part, because we don't know what the future holds. Anyway, Blake Christian's music hits now, and he comes out with Tony Deppin and Alex Zane. What a trio of great independent wrestlers out on the scene uh, right now. Blake looks terrible with his new short haircut. It makes him, it turned him from a pretty cool looking wrestler to kind of looking like an average guy that would be pumping gas at the gas station or something. So Blake is uh, an amazing wrestler, however. So, I mean, a haircut isn't going to make me think any less of him. Gates of Agony out next. That's Khan and Toa Leoa. Prince Nana comes out with them. And then Brian Cage joins them with some fire shooting out of the video screen. Um, so this is uh as good as the first trio um, team was the size advantage for what I formerly known as Tully Blanchard Enterprises, or maybe their new name will be the Embassy, which is the long running stable that Prince Nana had in ROH, but we don't know what their name is now. Anyway, they're three massive big guys, and the, the first trio was all smaller, um, flashy wrestlers. So 
a big styles clash in this trios match here, the six man tag, however you want to call it. Prince Nana is a prince from Ghana, and now he's linked with Khan, who also is a prince, but from Cameroon. So that's a pretty cool uh, side story to this new stable. I guess I'll call him the embassy for now. Brian Cage is going to start the match. So the fearless Tony Deppin gets right in big Brian Cage's face. Cage tells Deppin he wants someone else to start. So Deppin just slaps Cage in the face, and that starts the match. Brian um, goes on the attack. Deppin shows off some good speed and agility to avoid attacks here. De De Deppin then hits a rolling, uh, a huge rolling elbow, but Cage counters the next move into a power slam, and we get a nice close-up of Cage telling Deppin what to do next. Thanks, director, for that one. The director tonight has, was terrible. I don't know what his problem was or who it was, but we get to see Brian Cage telling Deppin what to do next. Thanks for that. Deppin, of course, counters the next move with a kick. Who would have saw that coming? And But Cage is able to keep control um, and hit a German suplex. Deppin cannot withstand many more big shots like that. Khan now tags in and hits a slingshot sent on to get into the ring. Good move for the big guy. Deppin, Deppin then counters a leg trip with a leg trip and a jumping knee stomp, kind of like a Meteora stomp to Khan's back. Now he's able to tag out. Alex Zane tags in. He's been tearing up New Japan the last couple of months, but is free to do what he wants right now with G1 taking up most of New Japan's time right now. Uh, Toa Leoa then tries to help Khan from the outside, uh, but Zane has had come in with a lot of fire. Zane counters their double team, hitting a hurricanrana that sends Toa Leoa out of the ring. Khan then flips off Zane, and I see that his left middle finger is completely bent. So if you're not quite, uh, if you're not familiar, finger injuries almost like bad finger injuries like that almost never fully healed to their correct straightness or whatever go look at the hands at some of the nfl american football wide receivers from catching so many footballs their their fingers are bent and mangled it's disgusting so yeah um <laughs> not to stop the match here but khan definitely has um, some mangled fingers so khan then tries to lead uh Zayn into an ambush outside of the ring. Zayn ducks the attack from Cage, and they both end up in the ring. Zayn is about to attack Khan, but Toa Leoa from behind takes out Zayn. Uh, Toa must have tagged in at some point, and I missed it. He stays in, and he goes to work on Zayn now. The, uh, the first two matches on the pre-show has me thinking RH will definitely be the developmental system of AEW, the NXT to um, the NXT of of. AEW, so to speak. So we de definitely got a lot of NXT black and gold vibes with this new ROH. Khan now tags in and Zane counters with a large uh or large something. I didn't write it down, but then a back elbow as well. Khan stops Zane from jumping off the top, and Khan hits a nasty side suplex uh onto the top of the turnbuckles. And then Toa hits a senton across the apron and gives Cage um hands Zane over the cage cage deadlifts Zane up with a massive suplex and now cage tags in himself Zane tries to counter and tag out but cage catches him and hits a massive wheelbarrow slam Blake then distracts cage and Zane is able to tag him in Blake Christian comes in uh, knocks gates of agony off the apron then hits a DDT on the much larger cage Blake Christian hits a nice looking Fosbury flop to the outside and everyone gets caught um by the by the gates of agony now or no, he gets he he. I think he just hits it to the gates of agony. Now Tony Deppin dives to the outside, knocks everyone down. Zane hits a sweet springboard moonsault to the outside on the cage now, and they triple team cage with some nice moves. All the small indie guys here. Brian Cage still is able to kick out of this, and the crowd absolutely loves what they've been seeing. So Khan runs in and takes out Deppin. A Pele kick from Blake takes out Khan. Toa comes in and takes out Blake with a big shoulder tackle. Zane leaps in from the uh, top rope for a missile drop kick to take out Toa. And then Cage super kicks Zane. But Tony Deppin's back up. The first one that got hit in that big flurry. Uh, Tony Deppin runs in and hits a jumping knee to the face of Cage. Cage does not go down and hits a discus lariat that destroys Tony Deppin. Then Zane and Blake t uh, take Cage out with Insiguri kicks at the exact same time. Gates of Agony are now up and they square off with Blake and Zane. But since Toa and Khan just stood there, Zane and Blake hit super kicks. Um, Zane then uh, charge and they both 
get hit with air raid crashes at the same time from the gates of agony who then turn their attention over to tony deppen deppen fires up and hits chops to the gates of agony but cage was lurking behind the whole time hits a pop-up power bomb and then khan hits the roderick strong gut buster toa hit and cage hit a double team move and that's it the one two three off of that the winners of the match by pinfall are Brian Cage in the Gates of Agony may be called the Embassy now, but they're not Tully Blanchard em- Enterprises. So great match, and I do love that they're now with Prince Nana instead of Tully Blanchard. Tully Blanchard, I, I have nothing against Tully Blanchard, but um, definitely makes more sense for them to be managed in ROH by Prince Nana as opposed to Tully Blanchard. So our last match on the pre-show or the zero hour, however you want to call it, will be Willow Nightingale versus Allison K, formerly known as Sienna in Impact Wrestling. So this might give uh, Serena and Mercedes a run for uh, match of the night for the women. So let's ch- I would definitely like to see both of them featured in ROH more in the future. Um, Willow is a star in the making with a ton of charisma. The crowd Every crowd in the world that Willow comes out and uh, to just absolutely loves her. And Allison K has been improving um, ever since leaving Impact. I've seen her in NWA, and I think she's been wrestling all over the world. So Allison K keeps improving as well. And she's definitely ready for some better competition, like a Serena Deeb or a Mercedes Martinez. So Coleman says what I was already thinking, that this is almost an unofficial number one contenders match for the ROH women's title. Allison K comes out first. She's got some pretty cool music. Allison K is from my hometown in Detroit, and I know her type. Her type, I mean, her gimmick, Allison K's gimmick is not a gimmick. That's just her for sure. I know those kind of women around Detroit. So Allison's got some unsettling makeup on. No offense, but it was uh, scary because it made her look a little bit inhuman. Maybe that was the look she was going for. But, man, it was uh, – give me that uh, – what's it called? Uncanny Valley um, creepiness. But anyway, holy crap, the crowd cheers very loud when Willow mu- Willow Nightingale's music hits. She's got really cool music. It sounds like – um more stay in the time or um something like that from back in the 70s really good music willow's uh generally uh genuinely happy from this response from the crowd smiling up big big bigger than willow normally smiles so if allison is gonna be on the roh roster going forward this would be a good time for allison to get some massive booze for uh cheating maybe even cheating the win on willow so the crowd would go ballistic if that happens. And if you watch my wrestling reviews, you know that I love when the crowd goes ballistic and gets furious. So um, Allison's butt is half exposed for everyone to see on this one. And Willow hits one of her signature moves to start the match. It's a cross running cross body to a seated opponent. That looked really good. Willow then cartwheels uh, to escape a hold and hits a nice insiguri kick. Willow then does a hip. Uh, by the way, Willow does have like the strength advantage in this match, the size advantage forgot to mention that willow does a hip attack into the corner then dances um grinding kind of on allison here disrespectful there again we get a camera close-up shot in the corner of the wrestlers telling what to do next what is the director doing here and of course allison counters right after that because we just saw them talk about it right after that a, a Bad camera cut misses the impact of an Allison K big boot. Who the heck's the director of this show? Kevin Dunn. I know he's Kevin Dunn's about to leave WWE because Vince isn't there anymore. But man, doesn't mean you got to go sign him for ROH right away. Jeez. Anyway, Allison takes control after we miss that big boot um, and hits big body shots and a chop. The crowd boos every single attack that Allison K does. They're 100 percent behind willow willow dodges the next chop and hits some chops of her own now willow charges in but allison counters this with a uh, back elbow allison then trips willow and applies a modified stf willow strikes her way out of this right away and the crowd chants willow's name willow then dodges a corner attack from allison that crashes her hard into the ring post allison was um in pain from that one willow hits another big chop right after and allison swings and misses uh, um, that move looked pain, uh, painfully contrived. This match has been a little bit underwhelming. Immediately after that, another um, contrived-looking um, roundhouse kick dodge. So what is going on in this match? This match is not clicking with me, and I was excited to see this match. They're not even going to come close to rivaling uh, the women's match of the night. So Willow comes back with a nice lariat, and both women are on the mat now. The crowd rallies them back to their feet. Willow hits a middle rope drop kick for a two count. No flow to this match, but the crowd seems to love it anyway. Willow then counters into a Kimura lock, but Willow gets out before it's completely locked in. And Willow then hits her uh, move checkmate, which is a nasty looking Death Valley driver. 
and or Louis Piccoli driver, if you want to call it that. Willow then gets caught in a triangle choke, but Willow is able to fight it off and hit a DDT. Allison blocks the next move twice, the next two moves, and then hits a vertebraker. Allison with vertebraker here for a two count. Willow is able to block a pounce attempt right after that, which that is one of Willow's moves. So Willow destroys Allison with a pounce, period, right after that. Willow, Willow then takes the straps down and fires up. Her next move again was a little awkward, but after that, Willow hits the doctor bomb. She calls it the babe bomb, and it's a gut wrench sit down, sit out power bomb for the one, two, three. The winner of this match is Willow Nightingale. That was a very sloppy match, in my opinion. It took me out with too many botches. The camera cuts, missing things also didn't help. And thanks, director, for um having us see that they were talking about the next counter. So anyway, Willow is a star in the making and should continue to get even more popular as more and more people um, see her as she gets more and more exposure on TV and big events like this. So I'm glad that Willow got to be here uh, more than anything, even more than like the match being good and stuff like that. Just getting Willow Nightingale more experience, uh, not really experienced. She got that too, but exposure is the word I wanted to say. So that's it for the pre-show or the zero hour. Pretty good uh, one hour of action overall to get you hyped for the main event or the main card. Uh, Prince Nana was the biggest news to come out of the pre-show. Um, but the main show should be even better, so let's get to it. And, yes, it was even better. Great show tonight. It is officially the start of Ring of Honor, Death Before Dishonor 2022, the start of a new era as ROH rises from the ashes. So we jump right into action as the announcers act super surprised that the first match of the night will be for the ROH world title. But this is exactly what I was predicting with the tag titles almost guaranteed to be the main event. I figured putting the world title match on first would be a great way to kick off the new era of ROH. So I think it's the right choice here and it will be an ROH world title match. Jonathan Grisham defending against Claudio Castagnoli. And Jonathan Grisham has been saying Ring of Honor is the company that held on to the essence and the foundation of what this industry is held upon. Brian Danson once said that this ROH world title represents pro wrestling freedom. And I still believe in that. For a very long time, I've done things my way. To recreate this company in any way I see fit has been somewhat difficult. And only a fool does the same thing about getting the same results. So I had to try it a different way. Tully Blanchard's way. So that's Grisham's excuse for joining up um, someone else's other f faction, which um, I guess uh, no, I wait till after. I we've got some big news that came out of this match um, afterwards, so I'll just wait until after the match to talk about it. But it was so awkward to hear Grisham say, "I'm gonna do it the Tolly Blanchard way." Like it's so it seems so forced. Um, and not believable coming out of Grisham's mouth and not because Grisham was a bad actor or anything. It was just completely unlike um, anything Grisham would have done in the past. Even if Grisham turned heel, I could have never um, imagined him saying, I want to do it the Tully Blanchard way, which. Mm. So anyway, that's Grisham's excuse for joining up um, Tully Blanchard Enterprise, which is no longer. It's now ran by um, it's now turned in basically to the embassy by Prince Nana. So tonight's event in Lowell, Massachusetts is 30.4 miles away from where Claudio Castanelli came closest into his career to winning a world title. And it was the ROH world title against Morishima in, in the main event of Death Before Dishonor 2020, uh, 2007. So 2007's Death Before Dishonor, so exactly 15 years ago. And Claudio says every time he's left the company, it was for the sole re reason of improving as a wrestler. So, And once I felt I couldn't improve anymore, it was time to leave. And look at now I've come full circle returning to ROH. So that was the little setup coming into this match that we saw in like the uh, countdown show and stuff. And here's Claudio getting a world title match, um, his first match back in ROH. And Claudio's out first. The huge cheers. Claudio has a white Blackpool Combat Club jacket and will be accompanied by William Regal. So I definitely hate Claudio's music with a passion. It sounds like a circus along with um, the start of Malcolm in the Middle just came on. So it just doesn't fit him at all. But either way, Claudio's been great in his return. Um, I mean, just like his debut in AEW and now returning here to ROH. The announcers say that it was a coin toss to see if this or the tag match would be the main event. So I like that they explained it that way. William Regal goes over the commentary for this match, which is awesome. And then Jonathan Grisham comes out. So Dr Grisham comes out, no octopus mask, no foundation flag. And I didn't even see anybody accompanying him. So that was super strange. We'll get into that more after the match. 
but um it was a little strange that Grisham didn't have his cool octopus mask here. Um, the whole octopus thing, uh, you might think, oh, why would he wear an octopus mask? It's going to be like he has like eight arms to tie you up in knots because he's like an octopus kind of deal. Um, and no foundation flag either, which was strange. Regal says that he feels back in Europe watching these two about the fight because both had the European style. Uh, Claudio, right as the bell rings, charges in for a European uppercut, but Grisham is able to dodge this. Claudio then gets wrist control, and Grisham spins on his back, kicks his way free. Awesome start to this match. There's a small Jonathan Grisham chant, but a giant Claudio chant uh, drowns it out. Now they lock up again, and again Grisham with amazing move the bridge and avoid going down. Then Claudio hits a giant swing, um, showing off that Claudio does have the strength advantage here. Right away in the match, hitting a giant swing, swing about 15 to 20 revolutions here. Grisham then bridges his way out of the pin after that, and Grisham catches the leg and dragon screws leg whips Claudio to uh, cross the ropes, actually. So Claudio uses his strength to counter the next attack and ends up with Grisham up on his shoulders. Grisham with, a, with about fourth or fifth amazing move already in this match, spins off of Claudio's shoulders and takes down Claudio. That was a great looking move right there. You might have seen it in gift form on, on uh, uh, social media if you haven't watched this match. So now I do see that Prince Nana is ringside. He must have came out after where to look. I swear there was no Prince Nana when Grisham came out. So anyway, Grisham hits a drop kick to the knee now, the same one he hit with the dragon screw leg whip. Grisham poses to the crowd real quick. Grisham now attacks the ankle and the knee at the same time and grabs the ears of Claudio while doing this. So Claudio is able to power out, but the damage has been done to Claudio's knee. Claudio tries to deadlift Grisham from the apron, but his knee gives out. Claudio is strong enough to keep his balance, which was amazing even after the knee goes out and he's able to slam Grisham into the ring anyway. Grisham then goes right back to attacking the knee after that and, and Claudio fights back with a backbreaker and a very European uppercut. Claudio tries to get the sharpshooter on but can't apply it, so he does a standing stomp to Grisham instead. Claudio's knee did not like that stomp. Claudio's knee was acting up on that one. So Grisham attacks the knee before even getting off his back here. Grisham uh, positions himself in, with his back to the corner and is able to keep Claudio at bay with some kicks until Grisham charges out with a big running uh, forearm. Then Grisham applies an ankle lock, but Claudio easily is able to power his way over to the rope to break the hold. Grisham tries to hit some chops for some reason, and just fire that just fires up Claudio. That was a mistake by Grisham, who now eats multiple uppercuts in response. Grisham's, I mean, Claudio's knee gives out while trying to do an airplane spin, and then Grisham hits a springboard moonsault right into another ankle lock. Grisham hits a few new near falls after that, and Claudio Claud, uh, Claud Claudio counters a charging Grisham with Swiss death, which is a pop-up uppercut. Then uh, Grisham counters with the Ricola bomb attempt with a roll-up by a two, for a two count. Claudio gets up, hits a big lariat, and the crowd are chanting, this is awesome. And yeah, this match has been totally great. So right, right as the crowd is chanting, this is awesome, Claudio then hits rapid elbow strikes, the hammer elbow strikes, about 20 in the row, then hits the Ricola bomb. The, which is a sit-out powerbomb for the one, two, three. The winner of this match by pinfall and new Ring of Honor world champion is Claudio Castagnoli. So this is Claudio's first ever major world title after a long and storied career, uh, mostly finding tag team success in his career. So Claudio genuinely looks emotional holding the ROH world title. Wish we didn't have to hear his circus music in the background, but this is an iconic moment that we're watching in front of us. Grisham shakes Claudio's hand. Uh, no funny business from Grisham, who um, didn't even really do any cheating in this match. And it looks like Tully Blanchard's way has been abandoned. So as I say that, I'm actually, full disclosure, doing this review a couple days after the event. I was really busy on Saturday. I had a lot of G1 stuff to cover in New Japan. I watched the first half of this show uh, yesterday on, on Sunday, the day after ROH Death, Death Before Dishonor, but I did not finish it until this Monday morning, two days later. So that is rare for me to ever watch a, a show, not all at once. But it did help me. Um, I was very tired and, and, and I was fatigued from watching wrestling and reviewing wrestling. So uh, I had a little bit of time to recover yesterday, even though I did watch half the show. But anyway, that gave me time to look at the news right when I uh, finished watching. So I just finished watching Death Before Dishonor about 10 minutes before I came on for this review. I looked at the news and the news is 
that Jonathan Grisham has requested his release from Ring of Honor slash AEW. Not only that, Jonathan Grisham's reported, no, it's not confirmed, but it's reported that Jonathan Grisham cussed out Tony Khan, the owner of ROH and AEW, while asking for his release. Now, I'm not quite sure why. There were some numbskulls online, on social media, people that are in um, have podcasts and are journalists that were saying, well, maybe it looked like Jonathan Grisham didn't want to drop the title here to Claudio. And I would I would say there's no way that Grisham got this mad over dropping the title. Claudio winning the title here is a great story, and Claudio is a great wrestler, and I don't think Grisham would have had any problem dropping the title. The problem that Grisham had was the whole, I want to do things totally Blanchard's way. And the reports are that Grisham was mad that, oh, you can have these white guys over here that their only character traits are that they're a good wrestler, but you can't have a black guy have his only character trait be a good wrestler. You got to make me a heel. You got to put me with Tully Blanchard. And then maybe, just maybe, it was Tony Khan's call to not have Grisham come out with his octopus mask and foundation flag, taking away the stuff he did have. And now Tony Khan was seemingly just wanting Jonathan Grisham to be a heel, cheat a lot, and um, do things the Tully Blanchard way, which was so cringe and weird coming out of Grisham's mouth in the countdown show. So I don't think at all this has anything to do with Grisham being a mark for himself as a, as far as not wanting to lose this match. I don't think that's it at all. I think it has to do with um, it really was how awkward, like turning heels one thing, but then having him say like, I want to do it totally Blanchard's way and doing things that maybe he didn't want to do um, kind of led to this. So um, we'll just have to wait and see what comes out of it. But I did immediately think that it was weird that Grisham came out for this match without his octopus mask. So, um, like I said, Grisham shook Claudio's hand and it didn't look like there was any funny business um, during the match or after the match. There wasn't any cheating within the match. So it looked like maybe if there was supposed to be cheating, Grisham just didn't do it. Um, so, I don't know what to say any other than that. Those are the facts we have right now, and they're not even facts. It's just reports, and we'll just have to wait and see how it shakes out. And hopefully, Grisham, if Grisham doesn't want to be there, hopefully Tony Khan will release him from his contract. I would like to see Grisham in uh, New Japan or Impact Wrestling or NWA. So um, there's plenty of, of places for Jonathan Grisham to go. Let's go into the back now. It's Lexi Nair, and she's with Daniel Garcia. This was an interesting promo here. So Daniel Garcia. Make sure he's going to get booed by this crowd by saying, Wheeler Yuta, you said I'm not worthy of the pure title. I don't even want to be worthy. A sports entertainer is above the pure title. Let me ask you something. Have you ever watched a sport and said to yourself, man, I wish this had more rules? No, nobody wants more rules. And Yuta thinks he can use that those rules to his advantage to systematically break me down. But it's not going to happen. I'm going to take this title, not because I want it, but I want to take it from you to I'm going to take it back to the big leagues, AEW dynamite, and I'll break it into a thousand pieces alongside the Jericho appreciation society. So Daniel Garcia saying that he's a sports entertainer. He's above the pure title and that he wants to take it back to the big leagues and destroy it. So, wow. Big heel promo there for the, um, Daniel Garcia, that should make the, that next match or that match more interesting. But next, we've got a different match. The announcers run down the card that we'll see later on, even though we already all bought the show. So I never understood why you need to run down the card when the show already started. Anyway, the next match is for the ROH six man tag team titles. It'll be the Righteousness, which is Bateman, Dutch, and Vincent. They are the six man tag champions, and they'll defend against Dalton Castle and the boys. So the Righteous won the titles at Final Battle back in December of 2021 against Shane Taylor Promotions, which was Khan, Moses, and O'Shea Edwards. And it's awesome to see Dalton Castle and the boys here. Dalton had a nasty back injury that kept him out of action for a couple of years. After uh, Dalton Castle is a former ROH world champion. So hopefully Dalton is feeling better and can stay healthy. But in a trios tag team, you could have Dalton Castle out there not taking as many bumps as he would in the singles match. So... Maybe they can get the boys established as a tag team as well doing that. And looking past this match, there should be a pretty good six-man tag division. There's the Tully Blanchard Enterprises slash Embassy. You've got, um, that was Brian Cage and the Gates of Agony. You've also got Lethal, Dutt, and Singh uh, just off the top of my head for potential big-time challenges for this title. 
Uh, the lights go out, and then Dalton Castle and the boys appear. So they are former ROH six-man tag team champions themselves. The crowd loves their flashy entrance, um, and great, great to see uh, Dalton Castle back. So then slow country music, creepy country music hits. It's Vincent's theme from ROH as the Righteousness now make their entrance wearing all white. They're accompanied by Vita Von Starr, who dances like a hippie to the ring, and they definitely have a weird hippie southern cult vibe to them. Uh, and if you morphed Vincent and Dutch together, you would get Ray Wyatt for sure. So Bateman, I've known him since he was on Championship Wrestling from Hollywood. Vincent Rick, uh, has been appearing weekly on Impact with the On and More faction recently. Um, so apparently the boys have graduated from being called boy number one and boy number two. They are now called Brandon and Brent. So maybe they'll graduate again down the line and get some last names too. Uh, the two leaders of the two teams here will start the match. That's Dalton Castle and Vincent. Vincent counters and uh, hits a really nice counter. It was like a tilt the world into a Russian leg sweep like that from Vincent right off the bat. Dalton bails the ring and the boys fan him off. Dalton fires himself up and comes back in, hits a huge exploder suplex. Dalton Castle popping of the hips. Some of the best popping of the hips on his suplexes out of anybody in the world. Um, um, Dalton then tags in Brent, one of the boys, and Brent tags Brandon in right away so that they can hit a triple team. Brent, Brent then tags back in, and they try to hit a double team, but a blind tag by Dutch is able to stop that. Duke now has, I mean, Dutch has wrist control and hits some lariats and a big slam on Brent. Vincent now tags in. Brent tries to fight back, but a back elbow puts Vincent back in control. A huge knee now by Vincent, and quick tags by the Righteous have Brent isolated. That's one of the boys. So Brent, Brent then flips out of a move and tags in Dalton Castle. Dalton takes both men off the apron and then hits a DDT on Bateman. Vincent now runs in. He eats a suplex, and Bateman gets suplexed as well. Brandon now runs in to hit Dutch off the apron. Dalton throws the boys over and over off the top rope about 10 times, hitting all three members of the Righteous. Um, that was a pretty cool move. The crowd loved it. The boys then form a chair in the middle of the ring for Dalton to sit on a throne, but Vita distracts them long enough for the Righteousness to get back in. Vita hits a springboard moonsault on the boys. Must have been behind the ref's back. And then the 300-pound Dutch dives to the outside with a Tope Con Hero, destroying the boys on that one. Then a massive double team, the brand, uh, triple team, the Brandon, I should say. And then um, Dalton's just barely able to break up that pin by shoving the referee into the pin. The referee does get in uh, Dalton a, a stern talking here, but no disqualification. Vincent then hits orange sunshine on Brandon. It was sliced bread off the bottom rope instead of like uh, the middle or the top. Then Dalton hits a head scissors on Vincent. Dutch hits a boss man slam on Brandon. And Dalton hits a German suplex on Dutch. So Dalton counters Bateman and hits Bangerang and gets the one, two, three. The winners of the match by pinfall and new ROH six man tag team champions are Dalton Castle and the boys. Uh, a lot of big moves in this match. Um, not a lot of flow, but it was still fun to watch. Just uh, more of a spot fest than a good flowing match. Still pretty good. And um, it's good to have, I guess, a couple of those on each card. Not every match has to be, even at ROH. Not every match has to be a Matt Classic or whatever like that. So it's good to have a little variety in your wrestling. We go to the back now. No Lexi Nair. It's just late. Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt, and Satnam Singh by themselves. They are all wearing white suits. And Sanjay says, the color white signifies many things. Happiness, smiles, pureness. But tonight, it signifies something drastically different. In Indian culture, there's only one reason why we would ever wear white head to toe, and that's when you attend someone's funeral. Mark this day down. It will be Samoa Joe's funeral. Then Jay Lethal says, everybody can feel it. That feeling in your soul. It's the changing of the guard, the passing of the torch, a new day here in ROH. And I will leave as the ROH television champion. Samoa Joe, you've got two choices, death or dishonor. And the choice has already been made for you. So that is not next. What's next is the ROH Pure title match. And it'll be champion Wheeler Yuta defending against Daniel Garcia. Uh, the first ever ROH Pure champion was crowned in 2004 when AJ Styles hit a Styles Clash off the middle rope to beat CM Punk, of all people. So 
having AJ Styles versus CM Punk in 2004 to crown the first ever pure champion tells you all you need to know about how important this title is to ROH. Um, not only for pure technical wrestling, um, or like for it's for pure technical wrestling without the sports flair, and it's also been a breeding ground for the next generation to become great. So the pure rules, if you're new to pure rules, include only three rope breaks allowed. After that, you can hold the rope all you want; it doesn't matter. It won't break any holds or pins. And then there's allowed two closed fist punches to the head. If uh, one is a warning, the second one is an automatic disqualification. And if you interfere in a pure rules match that you were not involved in, you are removed from the ROH roster. So at the death before dishonor here, uh, Wheeler Yuta will defend against Daniel Garcia. It's a pro wrestler versus sports entertainer for the pure championship. Yuta and Garcia have known each other for a few years now, but recently their paths uh, converged them uh, to turning into rivals. Garcia almost joined the Blackpool Combat Club, and those two might have ended up teammates, but instead, Garcia, who already thought he had enough natural technical abilities, joined up with Jericho Appreciation Society instead to work on his sports entertainment side. So with all of JAS not caring um, about this title, or, um, or if they're kicked out of the ROH roster, maybe we'll see them interfere. I wouldn't be surprised. But no matter what, this match is going to be good. The match got even more personal because you would have mentioned the car accident that Garcia had, which sent Garcia into a rage. So that might have been a tactic by Yuta to maybe get have an easier time um, getting Garcia to get mad enough to get disqualification. If you lose your cool, only a few close fist punches to the face, and it's all over with a DQ. So... Wow, Daniel Garcia comes out first, and he is wearing maroon gear exactly like Brian Danielson. Big uh, shot and disrespect here by the guy um, who is out here in Daniel Bra Bra uh, Brian Danielson's gear, flipping off the ROH banner. So Daniel Garcia, the crowd is definitely hating him. Plus, Garcia said he wanted to take the title back to the big leagues um, and destroy the title, the pure title. So Wheeler Yuta comes out second. The huge cheers. Uh, again, William Regal is out and awesome. Two of the first three matches tonight will have William Regal on commentary. And this match in particular, William Regal makes this already good match go from great to elite with Regal's commentary. Regal's commentary during this match is awesome. So make sure you watch this match. Um, if we go to a time limit, I think it's a 30-minute time limit. Um, the, it'll go to the three judges. Our three judges ringside are Ace Steel, the man who trained CM Punk, John Walters, a, pure, a former pure champion who saw uh, we saw in Elevation this last week, and then Josh Woods, the man who Wheeler Yuta beat for the pure title a few months ago. So actually, that was at Supercard of Honor. So Josh has a, his mouth guard in, even though he's being a judge here. That was kind of funny. So the bell starts, or the bell rings, and we start with a forearm battle here. So it'll be Wheeler Yuta versus Daniel Garcia. Pure rules in effect. And it goes to the mat right after the forearm battle, but they get out and square up again, reset. Yuta hits the big first slam of the match, keeps the pace slow, and the crowd chants, F him up, Yuta, F him up. We get a timer and a scoreboard on the bottom that keeps tracks of not only the time, but how many rope breaks they've used. And now both men are standing and grappling. They reverse each other a bunch of times. They both apply straight jacket holds. Um, but Garcia gets out of the second one uh, with a nasty looking headbutt. It hurt Garcia too, but it got him out of the hold and it hurt Yuta. So big headbutt there. There was nothing, there was no fingers in the way of the head, but it was just straight up. So, anyway, Yuta gets a front face lock on him after that. Garcia just lifts Yuta high above his head and throws him hard over the ropes to the outside. Garcia quickly follows him out there to keep the attack, sending Yuta into the barricade. Back in the ring now, Garcia yells at the ref for not counting the three, and Garcia is giving Yuta a little bit too much time to recover here. And right on cue, Yuta turns it around and hits a flurry of his own that ended with a standing senton. Then Yuta go, hits a great-looking arm hold while, while both men are standing. Yuta um, takes it to the mat with, in a single leg crab to quickly transitions to a leg vine by Yuta. After that, Yuta pulls the nose back, regal style, to grab the head of Garcia and puts the bow and arrow submission on. Garcia counters out of this into a pin for a two count. Garcia then... Um, Charges in, but Yuta ducks under and hits a nice German suplex. Yuta then maintains wrist of uh, the wrist, the waist lock, I should say, and hits another German. But Garcia blocks the third one, and Yuta counters right back into an armbar. Great uh, flowing match in this one. 
Garcia then bites the ear to get out of the, ar the arm bar, and the referee is now yelling at Garcia. Garcia grinds his forearm and wrist bone across the face of Yuta. Another regal type move there by Garcia this time, though. Garcia keeps the pace really slow and throws Yuta into the corner a couple times by flipping Yuta over, and Yuta's head was hitting the mat each time. Those were looking devastating. Garcia then uh, tries to hold or puts Yuta on the ropes, but Yuta gets Garcia to the mat and hits a drop kick from the top rope. Yuta quickens the pace now, hitting a huge flurry. We're at the 10-minute mark. No rope breaks have been used yet. So Garcia fights back with a big boot, and both men hit a clothesline at the same time, and they're both down. Regal says that he's trained Yuta hard to not use the ropes at all and escape everything without using ropes. So then a slapping fight now breaks out, and it was an epic slapping fight. Really stiff shots here. Yuta wins this exchange, and the referee starts a count for a knockout. Garcia is able to use the ropes to get up at nine, but that did not count as, as a rope break since it was just using it to get up. Yuta hits a German suplex right after that for a two count. Yuta now hits multiple elbow strikes, but Garcia counters it, hitting elbow strikes of his own. Then Garcia puts a sleeper hold on. Yuta is able to get out and hits a nasty high angle suplex, dropping Garcia right on his head. Garcia is able to kick out, but Yuta traps the arm by applying a cross face. Garcia counters this into a sharpshooter, but when Garcia cranks back he reaches too far Yuta's able to grab the head of Garcia and apply the bulldog choke the crowd's going wild on this one but Garcia counters out into the regal stretch of all things regal even goes quiet on commentary when that happens Garcia breaks the hold himself to go for some more strikes but that was a mistake as Yuta counters it into the walls of Jericho Ian Riccoboni on commentary calls it the lion tamer but the lion tamer is when the neck is bent too this was just the walls of Jericho they're two distinct moves so anyway, Gar that's I should be calling ROH over Ian Riccoboni, even though Re Ian Riccoboni is good. Come on. Anyway, Garcia gets to the ropes to break the hold, and that is the first rope break of uh, almost 15 minutes. So that was the break the walls of Jericho. So now they trade pins for a while, but Garcia hits a pile driver after that. You'd have just barely able to kick out and keep his title. Garcia now has both wrists locked and is looking for those Danielson stomps, but Yuta spits in the face of Garcia and counters into his cool pinning predicament that Yuta does where he traps all the limbs, and this gets the one, two, three. Wow. The winner of the match and still ROH pure champion is Wheeler Yuta. And um, kind of a flat ending, but a really, really good match. Like I said before, um, the match was made even better by all the things Regal was saying on commentary. You just guys have to watch this match if you did not. I would not be able to con um, con convey all the things Regal was saying on commentary that made this better. But um, you have to watch it for yourself. Anyway, Regal is most proud of you to not only for winning, but most proud for winning without any rope breaks, just like Regal taught him. So Regal says that he also respects Daniel Garcia, and uh, that's interesting. So maybe in the future we could see Daniel Garcia joining the Blackpool Comet Club. Maybe if Jericho Preaching Society breaks up or something down the line. So let's move on to our next match. It will be brother versus brother. And it'll be Roosh, the former two-time ROH world champion, against his brother, Dragon Lee, a former two-time ROH television champion. So they've both been on the same team and faction lately in other companies, even ROH before Tony Khan took over. But now Roosh has signed the AEW. Dragon Lee has signed the Impact. So I guess that's why they're going to fight each other here. Uh, I imagine Dragon Lee won't be sticking around until maybe in the future. I don't know how the Impact... Um, contracts work so anyway Roosh is out first and then Dragon Lee and this is guaranteed to be good because of their chemistry alone let alone the fact that they're both individually great so they have the exact same gear on even the same weird boots that look like leather feathers except Dragon Lee is in black and Roosh is in white and that is the opposite Dragon Lee is the good guy wearing black Roosh is the bad guy wearing white here so they shake hands even hug before the match starts Roosh uses a side of size advantage right at the start here and no clean break from Roosh. They grapple on the mat. Nobody can, can take control, so they just reset. Lee then takes uh, applies a headlock, but Roosh gets out of this. Lee tries a shoulder tackle on the larger Roosh, but it doesn't work. Then uh, Lee uses a kick and tries again, but Roosh then uses a huge punch to take control. Roosh gets a little bit cocky now and talks trash, then goes on the attack with a huge punch to take control. I mean, uh, with a loud chop. 
Lee then counters and hits Combination Cabron, the uh, Naito move in the corner. Then Rush counters back with a drop kick and a Tope Kanhiro to the outside. Really good match so far. I uh, love that they started a little bit slow. This should pick up more and more as the pace um, gets to the crescendo. So anyway, Roosh sends Dragon Lee to the barricade hard about four or five times. There's a 20 count in ROH, just like New Japan. And Roosh says twang, tranquilo before he goes back into the ring. Roosh then hits multiple strikes in the corner. And Roosh fakes a shotgun drop kick and slaps Lee hard in the face. Um, that shotgun drop kick is one of Roosh's signature moves called uh, the bull's horn or the bull horn. So um, he faked that and, and Lee bought in and then Lee got slapped in the face for it. And Roosh successfully baited Lee in the charging now. And Roosh hits a snap power slam out of that. The mind games are working uh, along with Roosh's size advantage and willing to do anything. It's going to be tough for Dragon Lee uh, to win this match just straight up. So anyway, Lee changes momentum with the head scissors and a dive to the outside. Lee then sets Roosh on a table sideways. It was a weird angle here. And then Roosh, I mean, Lee dives from the ring through the table. And that looked amazing. I am a jaded wrestling fan that usually says all table spots look the same. I don't understand why crowds cheer. We want tables because they all look the same. I've seen it a thousand times. But this one in particular was at an angle and, and way of breaking the table that I've never seen before. And it was awesome looking. So. Anyway, back in the ring, Roosh is able to kick out at two as the crowd chants. This is awesome. Lee hits like an Ushi Groshi looking neck breaker, but Roosh fires up from this and they have a forearm battle in the middle of the ring. Roosh switches it up to a chop battle and then hits a spinning chop. That looked great, but Lee is able to reverse a charging Roosh right after this with a ripcord suplex. Again, whoever the heck the director is cut um had a bad camera cut and we really didn't see the impact of that ripcord suplex so they switched to a shot that was blocked by a photographer's head of all things and we missed the impact of the move really really bad directors work tonight all night long um Roosh then hits the same ripcord suplex back to lee we actually got to see that one both men take a breather on the mat now once they get up Roosh hits a vertical suplex for a two count it was a deadlift version over the ropes um, since Lee was on the apron. Looked very nice. So they are both end up on the apron after this, and Roosh hits a few kicks, but Lee fights back, and they have a chop battle on the apron. Roosh isn't even holding on to the ropes, that meaning that he's super comfortable in the ring no matter what. Great veteran stuff from Roosh. Lee then charges at Roosh. Who, they're still on the apron, mind you, and Roosh hits a nasty-looking overhead belly-to-belly -belly suplex that sends Lee to the outside. Uh, from the apron jose the assistant has been here the whole time that's andrade's manager and he's out here managing roosh i did not see jose the assistant whatsoever um until this very point so roosh now stops to talk trash to the crowd and that allows lee to hit a hurricane rana on roosh lee was in the ring uh roosh had rolled him in the ring and while he was distracted lee jumps over the top rope and hit that um Hurricane Rana from the apron to the outside. Another awesome move. Both men now recover on the outside. It's a referee counts, and they get all the way to a count of 19 before getting in. Only one second left to spare. But now they should have some great stamina for a good ending here as they just had a little bit of a breather. And they, Lee, they go back to a chop battle in the middle of the ring now. Devastating chops. Lee then hits a big kick, but again, Roosh counters a charging Lee and hits an overhead belly-to-belly -belly suplex again, just like he did on the apron previously. Big shotgun drop kick called the Bull's Horns right after that by um, Roosh onto Dragon Lee, but Lee kicks out. Not many people kick out of that one. Both men now end up on the ropes, ropes I should say, and Lee traps Roosh on the rope, hits a stomp. On a hanging Roosh, but Roosh kicks out of this one at one count. Then the crowd goes absolutely wild. Nasty uh, dragon, um, a dragon something. I didn't write it down well enough, but Lee. Oh, no, I don't know what it's called, but it's a high angle sit down power bomb by Dragon Lee that looked devastating. Roosh is able to kick out by two, and that was a nasty power bomb. Lee stays on the attack and takes the knee pad off. Lee then hits the. Um, Uh, running knee strike again. I can't. I, I wrote down the name of it, but I can't read it. Un apologies for that. But a running knee strike by Dragon Lee. Roosh is still able to kick out at two. When Roosh gets up, he collapses to the ground. This makes Dragon Lee the brother of Roosh concerned. But it was a trap. Roosh goes on the attack and hits the bullhorn shotgun drop kick again for the one, two, three. 
The winner of the match by pinfall is Roosh. A dirty tactic to win by Roosh, but his mind games and counterattacks were always going to overcome the straight-up fighting by Dragon Lee. So great match here. Roosh now goes to 10 straight wins throughout AEW, ROH, and Mexico. So we do get some big news about that with those two uh, 10 wins in a row by Roosh. I'll let, I'll just let wait till later to let you know. Anyway, we get a recap video or a highlight package video for the ROH women's title match, which will be next. And it's not a new video. However, I covered this on the Rampage review in my Death Before Dishonor preview. So anyway, our, for the ROH women's title, it'll be champion Mercedes Martinez versus Serena Deeb. And without people like Deeb and Martinez, there might not even be an ROH women's division. Both women wrestled in ROH events in the past before there was even a women's division for them to wrestle in. So they were working hard to put women's wrestling on the map, but it was mostly a losing battle. So this gives the ROH women's championship instant prestige for the women that have never even had the chance for the fight for the title now fighting for it. It's because they, they were here before there was even a title to fight for. So, other story of this match is that Deeb and Martinez had formed a brief tag team that did not last long, but just long enough for both women to scout each other. So what they found was that each woman found that there was someone else on the roster as aggressive and um, willing to do anything that takes to win uh, aggressive and intense as the other. So each realized that the other was just as intense and aggressive as the other one. So uh, back in the end of, at, or at the end of the day, this Martinez was disappointed that Deeb chose to attack her instead of just asking for a title shot, which now makes this personal. Uh, Serena said that she has worked 17 years and now feels at the top of her game. And I have the exact same feeling. Um, Deeb has been like every time she comes out, you know, someone's going to get um, their butt kicked kind of the same feeling you have when Brock Lesnar comes down for a match. So when Serena deep comes out, you know, business is about to pick up, but Mercedes is definitely, it's not someone to be taken lightly. This should be a great match. So the professor Serena deep makes her way to the ring first. She's out here to stretch another woman while teaching another masterclass lesson. So the OG Barico badass Mercedes Martinez out second. She's got the ROH women's title with her. They shake hands before the bell rings and we lock up here to start the match. So should be a good one. No strength advantage for either woman. So they break the lock up and then uh, we see a, we hear a let's go deep chant from the crowd. So they are cheering for Serena deep in this one. They start grappling and deep takes control with the hammer lock, but Mercedes reverses it and deep is able to flip out and apply an arm bar. Mercedes powers out of this and into a knee bar of her own deep tries to kick out, but Mercedes blocks it and then stomps on the knee. The crowd is dead for this one, even though the match out, this is the match I was looking forward to second most behind the tag match in the main event. Um, unfortunately the crowd is dead. So deep then takes Mercedes down and applies another Another arm bar with a knee on Mercedes face for extra damage kind of regal style there again Mercedes counters but out but deep blocks the O'Connor roll Mercedes counters a charging deep with a big spine buster here Mercedes then hits a big corner attack that forces deep to roll out of the ring the crowd is still dead and I guess just some guys will never respect women's wrestling no matter what there's just nothing we can do about that. Mercedes then follows Deeb to the outside and tries to slam Deeb to the apron. Well, what we can't, hey, let me stop there. We can do something about this. We desperately need a women's only promotion. I don't care if they get bad ratings at the start. You just make it good. You get as much talent from all over the world as you can. And then WWE and AEW and ROH can get rid of their our women's divisions. And we can have a women's only show where the crowd is guaranteed to cheer for it because they wouldn't have showed up if they didn't like and respect women's wrestling. So uh, anyway, uh, Mercedes follows deep to the outside and tries to slam deep to the apron, but deep counters and hits a spear on the apron. Deep then takes a hard spill to the outside right after hitting that spear. Like when she, uh, like after you hit it, she went flying so herself. So Deeb's in pain, but fires up to go back on the attack. Both women are in the ring now and counter each other until Deeb hits a nasty flipping stunner from the from the middle rope. That looks great. Big Serena Deeb chant now as uh, that move woke up the crowd a little bit. And Deeb hits a European uppercut, but Mercedes counters the next one and awkwardly goes for a pin. A little bit clunky on that move, but not as bad as the uh, Willow Nightingale. Allison K match earlier that was super clunky. So Mercedes then hits a nasty looking half and half suplex. Deep tries to get up but just falls back to the mat. 
Mercedes then sets Deeb up on the top rope facing the crowd and tries to hit a super German suplex, but Deeb holds on and hits back elbows. Mercedes then applies a dragon sleeper while they're still up there on the ropes, but Deeb hits a bunch of more back elbows to get out of this situation. Mercedes then gets tied up in the tree of woe and Mer Deeb hits a running drop kick. This knocks Mercedes out of the tree of woe and Deeb applies an abdominal stretch. Apparently it's the, um, I now know that from watching G1 the other night that this is an all Japan style uh, abdominal stretch where the neck was taking damage too. So Deep then transitions um, to uh, having both arms trapped with the body scissors of Mercedes. Mercedes is able to power out of this and then they trade roll ups. Mercedes quickly gets an arm bar on, but Deep prevents it from fully extending. Mercedes now has a hold applied on Deep's neck, but Deep gets out of this too, and both women are now down. Uh, sitting down, kicking each other hard with the heel of their boots, I should say. Um, nobody gets advantage from this, and Deeb chant again from the crowd. Counters, uh, they both counter each other back and forth until Mercedes hits a running Meteora. Unfortunately for the champion, Mercedes cannot follow up, but it does give them both time to recover. Meanwhile, Deeb goes up to the ropes, and Mercedes is able to counter and hit the spider German superplex now off the top rope. Deep landed hard on the back of her head and neck. Mercedes now hits strikes and is looking for a finishing blow, but Deep collapses to the mat. Mercedes goes for a surfboard stretch instead, which is the setup for the Brass City stretch, her finishing um, submission, but Deep blocks this by biting the arm of Mercedes. Mercedes is able to keep control and Deep counters and hits a nasty looking spinning neck breaker. That looks great. Um, really, really good match. The crowd is now getting a little bit louder. So may maybe they all went to get a snack and use the bathroom when the match started. Some of them are coming back and cheering now. Deeb applies the serenity lock, her finishing submission, but Mercedes has enough power to be able to get in her to get out of this. Deeb keeps control and bangs the knee over and over into the mat and Deeb fires up and the crowd wants her to win big time here. Deeb applies an ankle lock, but Mercedes powers out again right away. Mercedes gets Deeb up on her shoulders. Deeb strikes but cannot escape. Mercedes traps Deeb into the turnbuckle and hits a big kick to the exposed face of Deeb. Then Mercedes hits an OG drop, which is a dominator from the Razor's edge position. Somehow Deeb is able to kick out of this, but just barely. Deeb then tries for the Brass City Sleeper again and successfully applies it. Deeb tries to fight out but cannot. She taps out the winner of the match by submission and still ROH women's champion Mercedes Martinez. So great match here. Me and the crowd both wanted Deeb to win, but Mercedes is good. And the two women hug it out as they move quickly move on to the next segment. But I'm not going to move on yet. Great match here. Serena Deeb, just um, like I was saying, I get that. That same feeling I have when Brock Lesnar comes out where I feel like, oh, he's about to destroy someone. That's the same feeling I get when Serena Deeb comes out. I feel like, oh, she's about to stretch someone and take him to school and stuff like that. So um, a little weird that Serena Deeb didn't win here, but maybe that means that they don't want Serena Deeb to go to ROH. I don't know, but maybe Serena Deeb is going to have something big in the future. So now that's two straight big title matches that Serena Deeb's lost at pay-per-views. Those are her last two singles matches. So I don't know what they're doing with her. This would have been the exact time to strike while the iron's hot. Hopefully they can keep Serena Deeb hot going on in the future for whatever she needs to do or whatever they're going to have her do. So they show a hype video for the next uh, match, and it will be for the ROH television title champion Samoa Joe defending against Jay Lethal. A lot, a lot of history. So long story short, Samoa Joe helped Jay Lethal from going from a guy who was just having fun turning Jay Lethal into a serious wrestler. But Joe was forced to use even more tough love to teach Jay that he needed work more. It accomplished the goal of making Jay reach his full potential. But in the process, Jay Lethal would never forgive Samoa Joe for um taking his television title away 15 years ago. So it's been over 15 years that Jay Lethal has been brooding and for his hatred for Joe. And um, now Joe wants to take, I mean, Jay wants to take Joe's television title. Um, when Joe did not want to fight, Lethal made sure that Joe would have a, uh, no choice by attacking him alongside Dutt and Sanjay Dutt and Satnam Singh until Joe was finally uh, forced to accept this match. So Jay Lethal comes out first. He's accompanied by Sanjay and Satnam, but Jay Lethal wants them to go to the back and will come out alone. So I wasn't buying this. I wasn't going to trust him at all, but we'll see how that goes. And um, 
by the way, they were the second three uh, trios team, or if you want to call them that, to come out in all white tonight after the righteousness righteousness did earlier. So the disrespect from Samoa Joe to Jay Lethal continues because Joe uh, Jay Lethal can't even get to the uh, ring yet before Joe Le- Joe Lethal before Samoa Joe c- music hits and makes his entrance before Lethal can even get in the ring. So Lethal's livid. Joe uh, kind of looking like he aged about five years since we last saw him. And then the two men stare at each other with only the entrance ramp separating them. So they both charge at each other and a big brawl starts before the match can even uh, get into the ring. Uh, Joe takes control and Lethal hits a big kick and gets uh, choked down. Then Joe slams Lethal into the barricade and Jay counters the next attack, hitting Joe into the apron. Joe then shakes that off and hits a big lariat and slows the pace down. And what a hectic start start that was, though. And I'm pretty sure the bell and it did not. The bell did not ring yet. Nobody's been in the ring. Lethal then gets up, rakes the eyes to buy some time to recover. The action hasn't gone in the ring yet. And now I see why Joe looks older. His hair is falling out at a rapid pace in the front. Uh, if Joe was just straight up bald like Lethal is, it wouldn't look as bad. But anyway, Lethal hits two Tope Suicidos in a row to take control. Lethal was in the ring for those quickly, but still the action hasn't gone in the ring and the official match has not started. So Joe fires up and hits some massive kicks, but another bad director shot. I don't know what the director was smoking tonight, but so many bad camera cuts tonight. It was just ridiculous. I don't know if they got Kevin Dunn to be the director tonight or what, but um, pretty much ruins this this, uh, running boot shot by Joe. Terrible camera cuts. Anyway, Satnam Singh now comes back out, and he helps Jay Lethal attack Joe, and they ram Joe into the ring post with a chair in between the ring post and Joe's injured shoulder. So now Jay Lethal puts Joe into the ring, and the match will start. So the referee has a tough call if he wants to start the match or not, but all the fans want to see this advertised title match, and Joe himself says ring the bell. So the match officially starts. Before the bell can ring, though, the referee kicks out Satnam Singh from ringside. Lethal goes on the attack right away. He's targeting the injured shoulder of Joe, and the crowd chants, Joe's going to kill you. Uh, Joe counters and then hits a big chop and a kick in the corner, a running back elbow, and a Pele kick right after. So Joe's showing you that he's not out of it yet. Lethal then rolls to the apron and hyperextends the arm of Joe across the ropes. Then Lethal goes to the top rope and hits a drop kick and gets back control. The crowd has a dueling chant of let's go Lethal and Lethal sucks as Lethal hits chops, but Joe chops right back and then Joe hits a running forearm. Lethal counters the next charge with a drop kick and Lethal stomps on the hand of Joe. This just fires up Joe, who then slaps Jay in the face, and Lethal hits an insiguri. Both men go down. Really good match so far. When they get up, Joe counters a charging Lethal again, this time with a back elbow. Jay bails the ring, but Joe dives to the outside with an elbow attack. That looks great. Joe then rolls Jay into the ring for a two count. Joe thinks about his next attack as the crowd chants, let's go, Joe. Then they have a forearm battle, but Joe counters into a roll-up. When Jay gets up, Joe hits a huge lariat for a two count. Lethal then blocks a power bomb attempt and drop kicks that hurt arm of Joe. When Lethal then charges in again, Joe hits a snap power slam to counter the charge. Joe tries to get the blood flowing to his arm, and now a slap battle breaks out again. Jay counters this into the lethal combination for a two count. Both men try to recover, but Lethal's up first and tries to put a figure four on, but Joe Bach blocks this with a big nasty kick to the exposed face of Jay Lethal. Jay stays in control, however, with kick. Uh, Kicks to the knee, and again, Joe blocks the figure four attempt. Lethal then sets Joe up on the top rope, but Joe blocks a muscle buster attempt from Jay Lethal, his own move. And then Joe uh, hits a standing shining wizard off the middle rope for a, or a diving wizard off the shining wizard, I should say, for a two count. Joe then uh, strikes and attempts to hit the muscle buster, but Lethal evades this by flipping out of it. Lethal then hits the lethal injection, but so somehow Joe kicks out at two. Lethal cannot believe it. Joe counters another charge by Lethal with an Uranagi slam. That's about five charges that Jay Lethal uh, had countered by Joe in this match. If he wants to think about what happened in this match, he can look back at those mistakes. Joe then looks for the muscle buster again, but here comes Sanjay Dutt with the distraction. It works. The referee was distracted as well, so Joe hits um, Jay Jay Lethal hits Joe right in the head with the title shot, and then uh, Joe kicks out of this too. So it seems like nothing will beat Joe tonight. Joe counters a lethal injection into a coquina clutch, but Joe uh, Jay Lethal immediately counters it with a jawbreaker. Lethal then makes the pin, but Joe counters this back into the coquina clutch, and Joe 
a Jay Lethal cannot get out and is forced to tap out. So your winner by the match by submission and still Ring of Honor television champion Samoa Joe. Really good match here. It kind of re uh, relied on kicking out of things that Joe shouldn't have, but the story is that Joe was so determined that nothing could stop him here. So the crowd goes wild. They absolutely love it, which is good. Sanjay helps Jade to the back as Joe celebrates his big win here. So really good match. I like this match a lot. Um, like I said, it, the story was that Joe was never going to be beaten. So you can kind of overlook the fact that they used relied on him kicking out of things a little too much, but that was the whole story. So after that, we get some big announcements for dynamite this week. So in addition to the two title matches that were already announced for AEW dynamite, which was thunder Rosa defending the AEW women's title against Mayu Yamashita and Ricky Starks defending the FTW title against Dan Housen. Now it's announced that the AEW interim title will also be on the line when Roosh challenges John Moxley for the title on Dynamite. So that's not all. Brian Danielson will make his return and fight Daniel Garcia, who just mockingly wore Danielson's colors while flipping off the ROH banner and, and threatening to destroy the pure title if he won it, which he did not. So Danielson will be fired up to destroy Garcia. But this does make me wonder why the heck couldn't Brian Danielson have a match on tonight's card? Or at least be here. I, it was weird that he wasn't even here. But I guess they're going to save that for, I guess, the big selling point for the next ROH big pay-per-view or whatever will be probably the return of Brian Danielson to ROH. So that'll be like the selling point for the next pay-per-view. So I assume they guess they didn't need, they probably thought they didn't need Danielson on this card. What It would have been nice to see him. Anyway, we get a great hype video that sets us up for the main event. Yes, we're already to the main event. And it is a long one, so they left a lot of time on the card for this one to be a long one. And we knew it was going to be a long one. It is for the ROH Tag Team titles. FTR defend against the Briscoes in a rematch of one of the best matches of, of the entire year. And this will be a two out of three falls match, as if it couldn't get any better. So the build for this match was great, even despite the Briscoes not being allowed to appear on TNT or TM TBS per order, per mandate of the network for past things that the Briscoes had said about the LGBTQ community. Um, the Briscoes have since then apologized, but that's not good enough for TBS and TNT to allow the Briscoes to be on their network. But we were getting great stuff on the AEW YouTube channel where they had a sit-down interview over some tequila. And then we also got a great epic promo from Dax Harwood talking about his eight-year-old daughter when she was five, had a hole in her heart, and would have either had to fight hard for rehab this, to recover from the hole, or she would have to get surgery. The, the little girl fought, and that little girl is now eight years old with a completely healed heart, and that little girl is Dax Harwood's um, daughter. So they ended that um, great promo by saying, we will fight the Briscoes. And we will fight like an eight-year-old girl, which was great. Great promo there. Great way to set this up. The, another big news came out over the uh, before this match came out, a couple days before the match happened here on Death Before Dishonor, that Tony Khan has officially signed the Briscoes to ROH, which tells you that ROH will probably not be on TBS or TNT since those people don't want the Briscoes on their networks. But by assigning the Briscoes here, it makes the winner of the match even more of a question mark. I would think maybe the Briscoes would win to keep a third match as an option, but the Briscoes could decide to put over the much younger FTR in a definitive win here. So I can't wait to see. <coughs> the first match was one of the matches of the year, <clears throat> making this one of the most highly anticipated rematches in recent history. Let me get a drink because this match is a long one. So, um, as if it wasn't already an anticipated rematch, I love the added layer of the two out of three falls match or rules. So, this is guaranteed to make it a different match than the first one because of that two out of three falls. And I'm just going to soak up and enjoy every single moment of this match. I don't care who wins. I just want to enjoy this match. So, the Briscoes come out first. The huge cheers. They look fired up for this one. And then massive, biggest cheers of the night probably when FTR come out. Um, they come out with with um, with the crowd chanting FTR right as they come out. They're holding the not only the ROH tag titles, but the IWGP heavyweight tag titles and the AAA from Mexico tag titles. 
The Briscoes, the Briscoes themselves are former IWGP heavyweight tag team champions and are 12 time ROH tag champions, the best tag team in ROH history. Two of the best tag teams in the last 20 years will be in this match. Briscoes have vests on that say top five dead or alive talking about top five tag teams. I would love to hear Briscoe's top five. Anyway, huge FTR chance before the bell even rings. All four men square up as we get a let's go Briscoe's chant as well. Quickly drawn it out by let's go uh, or just FTR chance. The bell rings and all four men are still staring at each other in the middle of the ring. Now the crowd chants ROH instead. So this should be epic. Matt, or, uh, Dax and Mark will start the match. And it's been a minute without any action, and the crowd is cheering the whole time. Dax and Max, or uh, Dax and Max, Dax and Mark tie up, but neither man can get an advantage at the reset. Mark gets the first shot of the match with a shoulder tackle, and now the crowd chants, Them boys. So the pace is super slow to start this match. This is going to be a long one, and it is. Dax counters a waist lock, and then Mark gets to the ropes. Clean break here. Mark then takes Dax down to the mat with a headlock. Dax gets to his feet and escapes while hitting a big shoulder tackle on Mark. Dax then shows his agility to counter out of, the, out of a Greco-Roman lock and tags in cash while maintaining wrist control and passing the wrist, wrist over the cash. Mark then tries to strike out, but cash keeps a chin lock on, and Mark gets out and showing great agility of himself getting out in the corner. Mark then hits a Japanese dra arm drag on a charging cash. Dax and Jay Briscoe now both tag in. Dag Dax takes Jay down with a headlock. Jay turns it into a pin for a two count here. But uh, Dax does not let go of the headlock even with that two count. Jay gets to his feet now, getting out of it, and hits two shoulder tackles. Dax ducks a clothesline attempt, but Mark hits a head scissors as the pace quickens. They both counter quickly until Jay hits a Sayuto suplex. Dax bails the ring. Cash goes to check on him, and so does the doctor ringside. So I wonder what that's all about. Seems to be looking at the shoulder of Dax, and I think that was the same shoulder where Dax was prevented from most of the match at Forbidden Door. Um, which I thought was mostly storyline. So this is probably storyline too. Kind of weird to have, the, have the doctor looking at him here though. Cash now tags in and hits a big uh, running shoulder thrust to the gut of Jay. Then a back suplex right after Jay now bails the ring and the doctor tries to check on him too. What the heck is going on? But the Briscoes just shoved the doctor away. They don't want any help. I don't know what this doctor gimmick is. They got going on early in the match, but I think that's the final time we even see the doctor all match. So I don't know what that was all about. Anyway, just a reminder, by the way, this match is two out of three falls. So Jay now gets in and tags in Mark. Cash and Mark tie up, and Mark gets to the ropes. No clean break. They just start chopping each other right away. Mark gets a chin lock in and tags in Jay. Cash counters and tags in Dax. So they hit a double team on Jay before uh, Cash leaves. Then Dax drops an elbow on the back of Jay's head. Dax tags Cash in, and they hit a back suplex for a two count on Jay. Mark tags in now and takes control with some big strikes. A blind tag by Jay, and they double-team Cash with a double shoulder tackle. The Briscoes are, are able to communicate with each other without using English or any language known to man other than the Briscoes themselves, which is... um. We see coming to play later on. Quick tags now by the Briscoes have Cash isolated with more double teams. The crowd rallies big time behind Cash, but Jay's able to keep control. Tags in Mark now. More big strikes to Cash, who is in trouble. Uh, they're able to catch, but um, Cash is able to catch Mark with a power slam to get out of this situation. Dags now tags. Dax now tags in and takes both Briscoes down. Jay hits, uh, gets hit with two German suplexes in a row, but Mark stops the third German suplex. Dax and Mark now trade quick pins for a two count. Jay now takes a cheap shot from the outside, but uh, Dax is able to kick out by at two. They a double team on Dax now as Cash is still down. Jay tags in while they double team, but Cash out of nowhere hits a huge lariat on Mark. Meanwhile, Jay was in control on Dax, but Dax counters and hits a DDT for a two count. Jay now counters Dax and slingshots Jay head first into the ring post. Mark tags in, and the Briscoes hit a doomsday device for the one, two, three. The first fall of the match goes to the Briscoes, and you only need two to win, so they only need one more to win. There's a few seconds of recovery after each. Uh, fall, but it's not very long. It doesn't really distract from the match at all. Dax now rolls up Jay without even getting up uh, for a two count. And then Mark takes Jack Dax to the corner or I mean to the outside and Mark hits loud chops to the chest. Again, terrible director work on this show as we hear more loud chops, but all we see is Jay chilling in the ring. 
this has to be one of the worst directed shows I've ever seen, which is a shame because the wrestling has been great. But whoever the director of the show was did a terrible job. Jay then goes after Dax on the outside, sending Dax into the barricade and another camera uh, botched camera cut now as we miss Mark going over to start a brawl with cash. We pick it up in progress. There was plenty of time to get over there after the barricade shot, but whatever. Let's just get back to the match. We get a good look at the chest of Dax now, and it is red and bleeding from all those chops. Wow, that must be extremely painful, those chops that he's taken, and he has to take a lot more chops in this match. So Jay then rolls Dax into the ring for more massive chops right on cue as we now hit the 20 minute mark 40 minutes remain in this time limit more chops again to dax's chest as mark's tags in now and the crowd rallies loudly for dax to get back in mark has a headlock applied dax is able to get to his feet and hit a back suplex to get out of the hold mark makes the tag first however and jay is able to run in and kick um cash off the apron with a big boot before dax is able to tag out dax counters a larry and then hits two german suplexes but jay blocks the third attempt and Dax is able to keep control. However, he looks over, but cash is not on the apron yet. So he sets up um, Jay on the top rope. I think, well, I can't remember if it's Jay or Mark because I didn't write it down, but we have another bad camera cut yet again. The director is terrible and all night long and we almost missed one of the best moves of this match. It's a super back suplex from the top rope from Dax to Jay. Whoever the director tonight is like actively sabotaging the show, I swear. But anyway, that suplex looked nasty. Cash then gets uh, back to the apron, but Dax is still down from that superplex, even though he was the one that did it it still hurts him but dax is able to eventually tag out and mark uh oh wait no he goes to tag out but mark now pulls cash off the apron no tag yet dax now eats more hard chops to his bloody chest as mark tags in and they hit a double team redneck boogie i thought that might have been it here but dax finds the strength to kick out probably thinking of the his fight that his daughter has so anyway, Mark locks in a sleeper hold while Cash now gets back to the apron. Cash risks it a little bit by staying on the apron instead of going and getting Dax out of the hold. But this way, he's just relying that Dax can get out and then tag in Cash right away. Cash wants to be on the apron to tag in. So Dax does indeed get out. Mark hits a bunch of chops again, but Dax counters the chop and finally is able to tag out. Cash now takes both Briscoes out, belly to belly on Jay, then a huge lariat on Mark. Cash hits a brain buster, and Mark is just barely able to kick out. Jay then goes to the out from the outside, helps Mark get control. Jay comes in the ring to help or try and do a double team, but Dax is back up, pulls Jay to the outside. Cash then gets a gory special uh, and hits it front on Mark for a two count. J Jay then throws Dax into the crowd. They battle over the barricade for a little bit and then into the crowd, both of them. So meanwhile, Cash throws Mark to the outside, and a four-man brawl around the arena breaks out. A table is set up but not used yet. Keep that table in mind. And uh, back in the ring now, Cash hits a crossbody off the top rope, but Mark still is able to kick out. Jay hits Cash from behind, behind the referee's back. In the head, Cash gets hit with the ring bell. The referee did not see it. Cash has a fire inside of him to kick out of this. The match would have been over right in there, right then and there, if the pinfall hit for two to nothing. So Briscoe then is able to double team cash, finishing with a Mark froggy bow off the top. Dax is able to break this pin and save the match. Mark is mad after this and chase chases after Dax, but it was a trap. Dax counters and charging Mark and flapjacks him right into the steel steps. Cash is woozy in the ring alone and busted open with a cut on his head from the ring post. I mean the bell, but Dax goes after Jay. Now who's after outside the ring. Jay sends Dax, packing with a big forearm and then jay goes into the ring and hits forearms on cash blind tag by dax now and they hit a big rig for the one two three so the second fall goes to ftr the next fall wins the match we're at about 30 minutes into the match 30 minutes left in the time limit so could they possibly go another 30 minutes without a fall or will someone get a big win here so let's see. After a short recovery period, Cash and Mark will restart this match. They get in each other's faces and then have a forearm battle. Mark is now busted open, too. I don't know how, but he, um, maybe from the, when he got Flapjack into the steps. So Dax now tags in, but Mark counters this with uh, counters his charge with a suplex that Dax charged right into. That looked amazing. Both men are on the apron now. Dax blocks a Uranagi slam. Mark goes to the back hop and... Um, 
back to chopping that red chest of Dax. And just ridiculous. Dax's chest was so red. They battle back and forth now. A big uppercut from Mark that knocks Dax off the apron. Then Mark hits a blockbuster from the apron to the outside on the Dax. What a match. I have no clue who's going to win this one or how it'll end. The crowd's chanting ROH as J tags in now. Dax blocks a J driller, but Dax is, hits a nasty uh, delayed pile driver right after that for a two count. The crowd wills both men to get back up and start fighting. Jay takes control and tags in Mark, and then they lock. try to put the Doomsday device again, but Cash runs over to help and throws Mark off the top rope. Dax yells for the big rig, but Jay's able to hear this um, big rig call out and goes into desperation mode, striking both men. So that's the advantage I was talking about with the Briscoes having their own made-up language. Um, meanwhile, FTR... Just yells out big rig, and obviously Jay knows what's coming. So Jay knew the end was near, and um, the yelling of the big rig woke him up. Dax then hits a big forearm on Jay as Dax destroys the referee with a forearm. I think it was meant to be Jay dodging it, but it kind of just looked like Dax turned around and hit the referee for no reason. Anyway, maybe he thought it was Mark or something. Um who knows, but that ended up looking uh, like it should be grounds for disqualification, but there is no disqualification in this match. Um, anyway, there's no referee now in the crowd chants. Holy crap. As the Briscoes take on their, uh, that's their cue to start a big brawl. Uh, Mark on, uh, has cash outside as, and Jay has Dax inside the ring. Dax uh, gets hit with a Jay driller spiking his head into the mat, but no referee. Jay makes the visual pinfall here for an eight count, but there's no referee to count it. Uh, Max and Cash recover on the outside uh, from the ring. Jay kicks Cash down and tells Jay to get back in. Briscoe set up for the Doomsday Vice, but again, Cash throws Mark off the top rope. Jay then hits Cash and they um, fights off both men. Uh, Cash then fights off both men, I should say. Jay hits a springboard crossbody, but FTR reverses it into the big rig. Dax then makes the cover and the referee is finally starting to get back in the ring. But by the time the ref counts, um, Jay is able to kick out. So this is the first ever time anyone's ever kicked out of the big rig, but the referee was not there to count it right away. So it's not really like, um, it, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, the crowd chants, this is awesome. And it is, this is really awesome. So Dax then puts Jay up on the top rope as cash climbs for a different corner. Looks like they were going to try like a superplex frog splash combo, but this time it's Mark that throws cash off the top rope. Jay counters Dax and they hit a doomsday device, but or they look for it, but Cash again. Are we? No, they do hit it, but Cash comes in and breaks the pin just in time. The crowd's all on their feet now, enjoying every second. This is a classic. The crowd chants tag team wrestling, and then Cash and Mark stare each other down. They have a striking exchange now, a slight botch next, but it's one of those botches that ends up enhancing the match. Mark was going to counter um, a suplex attempt and land on the apron, but instead Mark got caught on the ropes and Cash still had a hold of him. This slingshots Mark awkwardly back into the ring onto Cash. Both men kind of come down um, and come close to almost breaking their necks. They roll out of the ring out of this. They look hurt on the floor, but they both seem to be holding their shoulders instead. So hopefully the shoulders got most of the damage and not their necks. Um, 40 minutes are now gone. There's 20 minutes left in the time limit. Dax and Jay square up and they have a boxing match all of a sudden in the middle of the ring. Jay hits a big boot to stop the boxing match, but Dax springs right off the uh, ropes off to the big boot and hits a massive Larry on Jay. Dax is still woozy while trying to make the pin and it almost costs them the match and the titles as Jay counters this pin into one of his own. Dax just barely kicks out. Jay then quickly transitions into a modified camel clutch. Then Cash tries to break the hold, but Mark stops him and applies the same clutch. Both Dax and Cash are trapped and then looking at each other. Dax and Cash hold each other's free hand, not only for moral support, but to prevent Dax from tapping out. This is a classic revival spot from NXT takeovers in the past. Dax then uh, stops the hand holding and grabs the ropes to break the hold. The crowd chant FTR, FTR. And Cash rolls out of the ring as, as the Briscoes look for a double team. Yet again, Cash stops Mark while on the top rope. But this time, instead of pushing Mark off, Cash hits a massive back suplex to the outside of the ring through a table. Both men are down. The crowd chants, holy crap, as Mark can't believe what he just saw. Dax comes in from behind, tries to hit a pile driver on Mark. I mean, Jay, but Jay blocks it. And then another Jay driller. But this time is hit, but this time it did not spike Dax's head. It was more like half J Driller, half Butterfly Suplex. And because of that fact, 
fact, Dax is able to kick out. So it was probably Dax midair able to kind of land on his side instead of the top of his head. That's the only way he was able to kick out here. The crowd chant FTR again. Cash and Mark have not moved from going through the table. Jay tries another Jay driller, but but Dax collapses to the mat twice. Jay tries it a third time, but Cash blocks it, puts Jay up on the top rope. Then Dax hits a bunch of big chops. Jay hits some forearms. Dax falls off, but Dax gets right back up and hits a pile driver off the middle rope. Man, that was nasty. Dax then makes the pin, but Jay on Jay and gets the one, two, three. Holy crap, that that pile driver off the middle rope was the end of the match. The winners of the match, two falls to one and still ROH Tag Team Champions. Fear the revival, F the rest, FTR. What a match. What an event. What a main event. ROH is back. Um, it might be under a different banner. It might not be up to everyone's uh, snuff and speed and all that. But this main event match, what about 45, 50 minutes, never slowed down after that feeling out process in the beginning. And even that part was entertaining. So the fact that we didn't know who was going to win made this match even better. Dax and Cash celebrate, and the crowd's just going absolutely wild. Uh, Dax drinks a beer from a fan, then goes over to Jay to shake hands, but Cash is on the microphone and instead asks the Briscoes to get in the ring. Jay doesn't shake the hand yet, so Dax gets in the ring and they ask uh, the Briscoes to come in. And and Cash even says, please. So the Briscoes think about it, and then they join FTR in the ring. They shake hands and hug, but Mark is really mad, and Mark is yelling about... Uh, Mark is yelling at Jay about how mad he is. So then the Briscoes leave. Dak gets on the microphone um, and says, mf -er, I love professional wrestling. Wednesday night, I talked about how much I love my daughter. Every single day, I talk about how much I love my wife. But damn it, today, I want to talk about how much I love y'all. So Cash says, these broken tables, this blood, his chest, this is what fighting like an eight-year-old girl is all about. Dax says, I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Professional wrestling saved my life. You can call me an effing Mark if you want, but I love this crap. We'll see you guys on Dynamite. Top guys out. And then FTR's music hits. The crowd celebrates. FTR celebrates with their three titles. And you have to imagine an AEW title shot is on the way, maybe at All Out. So as if that ending wasn't good enough, Claudio, Yuta, and Regal, the Blackpool Combat Club represented on this show walk out into the entrance stage. FTR sees them right away and stops celebrating. Claudio claps for them, and then Claudio and Yuta hold up their ROH singles titles while the FTR hold up their ROH tag titles in response. The announcers say, find out more and watch AEW on Dynamite or AEW Dynamite on Wednesday. So, wow, sign me up for FTR versus Claudio and Yuta, and then hopefully that leads to FTR versus Moxley and Danielson. So, again, what a great event, a true celebration of the sport of professional wrestling. If you're an ROH fan that feels bad about AEW now owning ROH, just be happy that ROH isn't gone and, and buried. Um, like I said, this was a true celebration of the actual sport of professional wrestling, the exact things that ROH was founded upon. You've got a lot of old ROH legends that are here to um, help bring in a new era and we'll probably see in the next five years if ROH continues under the AEW banner I bet you ROH will be back to the the uh, former glory that you love it and with a lot of younger wrestlers coming up maybe they'll be populated by people like Wheeler Yuta Daniel Garcia Blake Christensen Alex Zane all people we saw on the show tonight all youngsters that could be the next um wave the next generation then you got your lee moriarty's as well so the only thing that i kind of was weird a black eye that came out of this show is jonathan grisham not being happy with his position um probably the whole heel turn and having to say i want to do things the totally blanchard way all things that are against what grisham stands for and and if Jonathan Grisham wasn't happy here, then then I then I hope he can be released and he can find happiness either in Impact or New Japan. Or I know he even has his own promotion, Terminus, where it's all about um, technical wrestling and just it being a sport. So many things for Jonathan Grisham to do. Hopefully Tony Khan lets him out of the contract. If he doesn't want to be there, um, let him go. So anyway, great, great event. Even the pre-show was great. We got about four great hours of matches here finishing with an almost hour long main event, two out of three falls, epic tag match. I think it's just as good. Uh, probably not better than their first match, but lived up to the hype. Uh, the first match didn't have all the hype and expectations behind it as this one did. And this one was still able to deliver a really good classic match. So 
Um, we've got some new champions. We've got some champions retaining out of tonight. The one that was surprising to me was Mercedes Martinez retaining her title. I always figured Claudio was going to win his first ever world title tonight, and I figured uh, it would be the first match of the night, and that's exactly what happened. Claudio winning the title in the first match of the night really just kicked off the show and, and told you what it was going to be all about. Um, the pure title match was great. I like that Garcia did not win, so we didn't have to see like the pure title getting destroyed on Dynamite. That would have sucked. Um, even if it was for storyline purposes, it still would have been awkward. So that's a good thing. And it would have gave, given the ROH fans even more fuel to not be excited about the AEW version of ROH had Garcia destroyed the pure title. I don't think it would have worked for Hill Heat. I think he would have found all those ROH fans that were going to give this a chance. They would have turned their backs on the product and looked elsewhere for their ROH type fix and, and some other promotion. So anyway pretty good night overall we got new six-man tag champions dalton castle and the boys they've got plenty of contenders that that they can fight against um including brian cage in the gates of agony or jay lethal satnam singh and sanjay dutt i assume that dalton castle and the boys are going to drop the six-man titles they're going to lose to jay lethal satnam singh and sanjay dutt especially now that jay lethal did not win the tv title samoa joe retains the roh television title so i think we'll see um Whatever the next event that we have, I'm pretty sure we'll see Jay Lethal, Sanjay Dutt, and Satnam Singh winning the six-man tag. And that'll be a chance for Satnam Singh to get some experience and not be in singles matches. I hope we go about two years without having to see Satnam Singh in a singles match. And then he can try and develop and see if we can have anything from there. So I think that's what we'll see. I think that's what uh, Jay Lethal will do. He'll, he'll probably win the six-man tag titles, mostly with uh, Satnam Singh doing all the work kind of deal. So. Um, We'll have to see how the women's division shakes up. I did not expect Mercedes to win, but um, now it has me intrigued. What does AEW slash ROH have in store for Serena D? Because Serena D is very over with the crowd right now, despite her being a heel. Like I said, I get that same the same vibe I get when Brock Lesnar comes to the ring. I also have that same feeling when Serena Deeb's coming out to the ring. I feel like she's that big of a threat and she should be winning. She's now lost in back-to-back -back big title matches at, at pay-per-views. Uh, first losing the AEW title match to Thunder Rosa and now losing this ROH women's title match to Mercedes Martinez. So where does Serena Deeb co go from here? She's probably my favorite women's wrestler in all of wrestling right now and um, I hope they have something planned for her. So I, I don't mind that Serena Deeb didn't win the title, but as long as you have something planned for her in the future, it's going to be unfortunate that Jonathan Grisham won't be a part of the ROH going forward, but um, I hope he can find happiness with whatever he wants to do. Don't forget, we had a couple of big announcements for Dynamite, including Roosh will challenge Moxley for the AEW Interim Championship, as well as the return of Brian Danielson. He will fight Daniel Garcia, who flipped off the ROH banner tonight while wearing Danielson's colors and gear. So. Really, really good match. Um, I'll be back uh, next time you'll see me for AEW will be for Elevation and BTE review. So I'll have that out later today at some point, uh, maybe even in like 12 hours from now. But uh, it will be out. Um, thanks for tuning in. And please give me a subscribe. I got tons of different reviews on here trying to build the channel up, trying to bring um, almost like a sports center style without being able to show highlights coverage of the wrestling world. That's what I'm trying to do over here. So um, tell your friends, give me a subscribe, hit the thumbs up, and uh, thanks for tuning in. I'll talk to you guys again real soon, and have a great day. Peace.